is quite a bit of effort, so it should be fine. Are you ready? So you're supposed to be? Welcome to the Institute for Life Course and Aging. On behalf of our director, Dr. Lynn McDonald, uh, she apologizes for not being here uh, today with us. She's busy trying to write a grant proposal. Um, I know what that feels like. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, but we welcome you. We are here, as you can see, also uh, webcast in the event, so there are people joining us online as well. And we are very honored to have Dr. Tiffany Chow with us here today. Um, Dr. Chow is um, senior scientist at uh, the Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest and uh, she's just become a senior scientist this year and I, I can see that that's well deserved seeing the, the list of research uh, projects that she's been doing. She's been uh, quite busy working with a, a number of people that are also familiar to us here at the Institute uh, like Sandra Black, Dr. Sandra Black, Benoit Bossant, uh, Bruce Pollock and Don Stuss and uh, Cheryl Grady are people that have, you know, collaborated with the Institute over the years. Um, and before she came to Toronto, uh, Dr. Chow was also um, an assistant, I guess, uh, a director rather, of a couple of clinics at the University of Southern California and an assistant professor there, yes, in neurology at the University of Southern California. Uh, so. Um, we are so pleased to have her here with us today. And her uh, research has been getting a lot of media attention. She's been on TVO's uh, The Agenda with Steve Pickin and another program on TVO as well as with uh, CBC and The National. So thank you, Tiffany, for coming today to talk to us about your research uh, we're looking forward to. Yeah, so thanks for coming in the cold weather. And for those of you who are looking at the webcast, I hope we'll be able to keep you entertained over the computer. Um, one of the things that I've been doing on the side of my research is uh, talks for lay public about what they can do to present, prevent themselves from getting dementia. Whenever I go to conferences, I'm taking mental notes for myself, um, but also for my patients and their families in terms of what can you do at various points along your lifespan to address your fear of having cognitive impairment or even dementia um, once you're in your late life. Um, so I thought this institute was a perfect place to discuss some of the ideas that are uh, relatively new to me um, in, in the last couple of years. Um, certainly there are some specific projects that I'm doing with infrontotemporal dementia and with neuroimaging. Those are all well and good, but most people that I meet at a cocktail party really want to hear about this stuff. Um, so I'm happy to share this with you. I have two objectives today. Um, it's, it's interesting when you have to make an objective slide it sounds like it's going to be so easy, but these topics are quite complicated and of course we don't have that much time. I want to really go on for only about 45 minutes and leave the rest of the time for discussion. Um, so I'll do my best to at least introduce you to some of the hot points within these objectives uh, and then we can discuss them together at the end of the talk. So the lifespan. Um, I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle as I'm talking to this institute about what the lifespan is. But for those who are not as familiar with the, with the lingo, um, the lifespan can start with um, where we are right here. As an embryo developing, you've got a lot of genetics that have programmed what's happening in that moment. And you have some environmental input, like what's going on with the placenta, how's mom doing, uh, but at that point in your life, that may be the time where you have 50-50 input from genetics and your environment. Because after you get out of the womb, it's almost all environment. And you have a, a genetic foundation with which to deal with those things, but there's a lot less control over what's coming to you from the people around you, the environment, climactically, toxic exposures, etc. cetera. Um, then you're a baby, then you're a child, it's during those first five years of life that the brain is really taking off, right? 
it's the same size. Your head, actually, you grow into your head to a certain extent. But the way your brain is making connections, getting all those cells hooked up into a way that will be meaningful for your function is really important. That's why, uh, for instance, in terms of where in your lifespan a certain insult might be even worse for you, when you have a childhood head trauma, you might be able to recover well from it within a short period of time because of that plasticity. However, it may have further reaching consequences as opposed to having head trauma when you're in your 30s. This is all interesting work and it's relatively new to clinical neurologists. We try to get a sense of whether a brain injury is bad for you or not, but in terms of breaking it down into different pieces of the lifespan and evaluating which has more cumulative weighting to how you're going to end up in your late life is relatively new and, and very exciting. Adolescence, of course, we all think of difficult adolescence. We think of hormonal surging during adolescence, but the hormonal stuff is going on throughout the lifespan in different ways. And, and, the, and that's really becoming important as we talk about whether you need hormone replacement in late life to avoid getting cognitive impairment. Then we've got the midlife section. You're working, you're parenting, you're not getting enough rest, you, you have maybe more stress than ever before, and hopefully, over all of this time, you're setting yourself up for great retirement, financially and emotionally and cognitively. So I'm going to try to address this uh, in whatever way I can. Let's start off with the genetics. Our understanding of genetics in the past was that you, you luck out or you're unlucky. You've got a genetic mutation that will give you a disease 85% of the time, not good. But it's so much more intricate than that. I put up the, the ad for that old movie, Gattaca. I can't believe it's so old now. But it was considered science fiction in its time. And uh, for those of you who may not have seen it, you, you are able to um, go to the birthing center, which is not just a labor and delivery room. You go to the birthing center because of all of your in vitro fertilized embryos, you can pick out the ones that have the best genetic profile. And Ethan Hawke is born as a pretty darn healthy looking baby. They stick him in the foot, they put the blood on the machine. This is all in the labor and delivery suite. And chick, 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 just like a, a receipt coming out of the cash, uh, it says what his relative chances of having some significant illnesses in his life will be. This is all within the five, first five minutes of his birth. And unfortunately for him, it comes up that he has a 30% risk of dying from an early cardiac event which dashes his hopes of becoming an astronaut. And so some of the wonderful ethical questions that arise from the movie are, is it fair to discriminate against someone genetically? And over the course of the movie, and this is why I like the movie so much, there's his environment and the thing that they didn't have the genes for, which is his personality. He was incredibly persistent and stubborn, and he found a way to get around the system and get himself up to space at the end. We ruined the ending. <laughs> Spoiler alert. But, but it's really important for those who have been told that they have a genetic risk for a dementia to know that there are a whole bunch of other things that will impact that one factoid. One of those things is that it takes a combination of genes to create a certain outcome, unless it's a specific mutation that's known to cause an illness 85 to 100 percent of the time. With Alzheimer's disease, we don't really have a lot of mutations identified that cause the disease in the majority of patients. Instead, we have some clues that there are combinations of genes that might make you more vulnerable. We also know that there are gene-gene interactions, gene-on-gene -gene fighting for what's going to happen, who's ha who has control over the brain. So if you are lucky enough to have two competing genes, then two wrongs make a right, and your risk isn't necessarily increased. However, if one of those genes, for whatever reason, slows down the production of that protein, then you're out of balance. And then the risk for Alzheimer's disease becomes present or declares itself. So that's the new genetic science. It's not so new to those people who are in high school now. It's very interesting how much they learn in high school. But, but for those of us who grew up a while ago, uh, there's a lot to be learned. There's something called a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SNP. And these are actually more important in the research now than the gene that gives you red flowers versus the gene that gives you white flowers. Mendelian genetics is like for toddlers now. And then there's this whole thing about the interaction of genes that's so important. 
And that's why the Human Genome Project has really revolutionized how we look for what's going to happen to people in the future. Um, so the, the premise of Gattaca was interesting and important and it brought up a lot of issues that are still very current. Um, so I mentioned sex hormones before in terms of adolescence. Um, and the fact that the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is higher in women has led a lot of people to assume that it is menopause that's bringing this on. That led to some very expensive studies that uh, explored, okay, well, what if we give hormone replacement to all these women who have aged, have gone into menopause? And I'm sure all of you have heard in the news that actually hormone replacement is not for every woman. You can get a higher risk of heart attack, a higher risk of stroke. What's up with that? It was good for us before. Why is it not still good for us? Well, it turns out that at different points in the lifespan, the presence of hormones is more uh, uh, promotional of cognitive uh, connection building. So synapses between neurons can be enhanced when you put estrogen and neurons in a petri dish together. However, in the real life situation, you are a growing person with different needs. So in adolescence, we have our growth spurt, we're becoming more socialized, hormones, hormones, hormones. In early adulthood, early midlife, very important to have the same level of estrogen pumping along. Otherwise, you're not feeling well, you're not doing well. Note that there are women in childbearing years who have mommy brain or postpartum depression. A lot of that has to do with hormonal surges. Mommy brain, however, you gotta admit, a good chunk of that might, might be due to sleep deprivation or too much general stress, trying to balance the work and the relationship with the father of the child and being a new mom. Um, but these are all important times for us to try to have a stable flow of the estrogen and a balance against the progesterone. In the O-operectomy studies, so women who have some kind of ovarian disease and they need to have one or both ovaries removed, come in all ages. They could be earlier in their reproductive life or they may be postmenopausal. And it's very interesting that the ones who are premenopausal need the hormone replacement therapy in order to keep functioning at the level that they need to. Those who are postmenopausal at the time of the ovarectomy don't necessarily need the hormone replacement. So this is a clue that you really want to concentrate on the hormones and the estrogen levels earlier in life, but maybe not so much afterwards. And there's a lot of setting up that happens up in your lifespan right on up to late life that predisposes you or keeps you protected from dementia. So the, the lesson that I'm learning from the different articles that are coming out about hormone replacement therapy is pay attention to it earlier, less important to expose yourself to the risk of stroke and heart attack as a postmenopausal woman. Interestingly, there isn't as much research being done on men, but there is a small body of information about testosterone replacement. The equivalent of an oophorectomy for a man would be an orchiectomy if they get testicular cancer, which usually happens in their younger years, 20 to early 40s, they need some testosterone replacement. It has to do with the muscle to fat ratio, it has to do with mood, um, and uh, mood stability actually, and it also probably plays a role in how their cognition is going. Now I told you about the estrogen and the neurons and the petri dish. For men, they do a special thing with their testosterone. They have a cyclooxygenase enzyme that actually converts their testosterone into estrogen for the uses of those cells in the brain. So very interesting. They had their ways of doing things. We always knew that, but we didn't know that necessarily specifically. Um, now, there may still be gender differences in terms of the timing of when you need to have higher sex hormone levels yet to be determined. It's a really open, wide open frontier in research. So if anybody watching this is interested in following up on that, please do. Um, another fun tidbit is about smoking. Um, anybody in this room smoke? Even occasionally? One or two? Cigar, <laughs> down at the beach, on a sunny former day? Former smoker. Okay, former smoker. So smoking is a big part of our culture, like it or not. Um, there are a lot, all kinds of ways of discouraging smoking, but some people are gonna smoke. I have patients who have at least smoked up until a certain point in their life where they had a health problem. That scared them, they finally stopped. Um, interestingly, if you absolutely positively had to smoke at some point in your lifetime, the time to do it is not when you're nine or 10, not when you're in college, trying all the drugs. Wait till after midlife if you're worried about getting dementia. 
and some of the numbers are on this slide. After these researchers adjusted for all the other things that can contribute to cardiovascular risk factors and therefore dementia risk factors, your hazard ratio, another way of estimating your risk of getting dementia, was twice. If you had smoked even just a half a pack per day, now you smoked before, half a pack per day isn't very much, right? That's like social smoking at lunch and at dinner, and that's it, that's all you get. So really, hold off, if you want to try it late in life, then maybe it'll be better for you in terms of avoiding dementia. Now, dementia is not the only thing in life that people are afraid of, but I'm the dementiaologist, so I'm going to concentrate on trying to keep you from getting dementia in late life. Now, they broke it down into separate um, types of dementia. Dementia is just an overall category of diseases that keep you from being able to function independently because you're having declines in two or more cognitive domains. Memory is a cognitive domain. Calculations or mathematical abilities is another cognitive domain. Social skills and personality is another cognitive domain. So for Alzheimer's disease, the risk is even higher than just twice. If you're smoking only half a pack per day, up somewhere in your midlife or earlier. And then for vascular dementia, it's even more. As you can imagine, vascular dementia is when you have enough stroke damage to the brain to take out some of its functions. So everybody, I think, knows and understands and accepts the risk that if they're smoking, they're increasing heart attack and stroke risk. You're also increasing your vascular dementia risk. Stress. Stress feeds into your cardiovascular risk factors. It can raise your blood pressure, make you unhappy. When you're depressed, you don't think as well. You're not able to multifunction, multitask. Um, and it's harder to remember new information. Interestingly, there are different points in the lifespan where stress will have a larger effect on your brain development or your brain function than others. So at the very beginning of life, like birth, you don't want to have any stress in place for the health of the little part in the deep underside of your brain called the hippocampus. So those of you who are planning to have children, you want to have all the nice mood lighting and the music and and, and I think this is part of why when you have uh, fetal heartbeat deceleration showing that the fetus is under stress, the obstetrician gets right on it and uh, he does whatever possible to bring that baby into a, a supported atmosphere where it's going to have less perceived stress. From mid to late life uh, is the other stretch where stress, which raises your cortisol levels, is going to have a big impact on that hippocampus. So it actually means the other way around, the glass half full way. So when you're a child, when you're an adolescent, go ahead and stress out uh, because it's not having as much of an effect on your hippocampus as other things like blood flow or perhaps your diet. All of us know from lifetime experience, however, that when you're stressed out, you're probably not paying as close attention to what's going on with your diet. You may not be exercising as much, et cetera. So, the, the common sensical thing is try to form habits where you can deal well with the stress that comes into your life. There's no, there's no way to be alive and interacting without having some kind of stress. There's good stress, like I'm getting ready for my wedding. And then there's other stress, like I don't know why I signed up to submit three grants at the same time, but I did, and now here I am. <laughs> Somebody, shoot me, it, that kind of thing. We want to not go to that roller coaster range of stress. Um, now, Hi. interestingly, uh, from what I'm hearing, during your parenting years, obviously a lot of good stresses um, and bad ones, that can re reduce your performance efficiency. Less multitasking, less able to remember a long list of items. But that kind of difficulty with your cognition is reversible. Get more sleep if you can. Get more help. Let people do things for you. Um, so one of the themes that I've been tapping at so far is consider the sustainability of what you're doing in your life. Um, and, and when you're talking about the lifespan, it's hard not to ignore this book, which many people have heard of or had excerpts from. The Robert Fulgham is now in its like 28th edition because it's remained popular for so long. And so I've taken a few of those concepts and, and blown them into um, the topic at hand. Um, so speaking of hands, wash your hands before you eat. Okay, it's a kindergarten thing, but it has to do with us considering what are you putting into your system? Okay, and that can range from 
uh, what kind of stress are you loading into your system and in terms of activities or what kind of diet am I eating what kind of toxins whether they're naturally occurring ones or environmental hazards are coming into my system and possibly altering the plasticity of my brain or having an effect on the immune system. I think everybody hears through the lay press that if you expose yourself too much to various things, electronic, electrical fields or um, too much sugar, blah, 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 this has an effect on the immune system. I'm not an expert on exactly how much of each thing is good for you. It's interesting that the government, in coordination with the telecommunications industry, has published standards for how close you should be to an antenna tower, things like that. It's, it's, it's buyer beware, um, because there, there are tainted sources for what the standards should be. Um, in any case, the immune system comes into my discussion about dementia, because it turns out that the immune system is a large effector of the changes that occur in the brain that lead to cognitive impairment. There are abnormal proteins that accumulate in most of the dementias that we have characterized very well. It's not necessarily the proteins themselves that are the problem. It is the brain's response to their presence that gets you into trouble. So you've got your brain cells, you've got blood, you've got fluid in there, all good, and now you've got an accumulation of protein that's taken up space and looks like a foreigner to the immune system. The immune system cascade gets in there and tries to eliminate it, but there's collateral damage around it. So if you can keep your immune system doing what it's supposed to do, theoretically, we can uh, water down the effect of the immune system that damages the brain over time. Some people have put out the theory that this accumulation of proteins is coming along because it's a response to the immune system being overactivated by something else that we haven't identified yet. You know, the, the gunman behind the, the grass knoll, that kind of thing. So it's a very interesting, complicated problem. In any event, no matter whether it's the grassy knoll theory or otherwise, the immune system needs to be working appropriately for us to enjoy better health over a lifetime. If you have your immune system kicked up too high for a long period of your life, it actually tires it out in a sense. I'm, I'm putting it in lay language, but it doesn't set you up well for your late life. You don't want to tax the immune system if at all possible. Now, there are things about uh, exercise that everybody hears about. The common sense is get some exercise your entire life. Um, but there are some specific things about exercise and dementia risk that are worth mentioning here. Um, if you have been, if you have ranged more towards the couch potato side in your lifetime, the time to make that big change is today or midlife. Don't wait till you retire and say, yeah, once I retire, I'm going to join the club and I'm going to lose this weight and I'm going to exercise regularly because unfortunately from a dementia risk standpoint, it's too late. You need to be doing it at least in midlife. Studies on women show that the greatest effect it's had if your activity level, your sports activity level is high in your adolescence and early adulthood. So those of you who participated in team sports and carried that on through university and for a little while afterwards, good on you. I'm not sure exactly what the mechanism of that benefit is. And so I've listed some of the, my, uh, you know, the theoretical um, benefits. It, it, all of them may be true to a certain extent. Um, certainly good habit formation. I talked about that in terms of how you cope with stress, how you fit exercise into your life. It's really hard to cram things into your schedule as life goes on. You're answering to other people, um, but if you can make some time for yourself in this way, I think that's, that's an important part. Um, exercising in and of itself, unless you're doing the wrong kind of exercise for yourself, can reduce stress. If your exercise is causing you more stress, then perhaps you should reevaluate. A girlfriend of mine got involved in a rugby team, and uh, it's a rough sport. They don't have pads. She would come in and she'd show me this huge bruise on this leg and she broke her nose and all of those things. And I, I you know, she was having a good time though. So <laughs> stress is also to a large extent perception. <laughs> so it was stressful for me to have her walk into my office and tell me all this, but she was enjoying it. So whatever. Um, 
Exercising enhances your cerebral blood flow. We're really into your brain getting as much glucose as it wants and as much blood and oxygen as it wants. This can contribute to your obesity management plan and to a certain extent, it creates social interactions, which I'll tell you about a little bit later, are very important as part of the uh, package of things that you can do for yourself to reduce your dementia risk. Um, even if you do a solo sport like running, people who run tend to get into competitions, they meet other people, they talk to other runners, they shop at the, the runner's room together. It's, there is some social interaction that comes with an exercise program. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. That's from this kindergarten book. Um, and comfort is important, so thumbs up for that. However, we need to really be aware of high glycemic index and what that does to you. I think most people know even from television shows that when you, when you really want to knock your child out, you give them the sugariest breakfast cereal and you watch about 15, 20 minutes later, they're gonna go down. This is cranky cranky and then down. So we want to avoid the roller coastering, and it's not actually a good thing to teach your children <laughs> how to roller coaster up and then crash. So we all need to be aware of what the relative glycemic index of the foods we like to eat are. It's not like I'm saying I don't have any cookies, but I do realize that if I'm gonna binge on a cookie thing, I'm going to crash later on. So I need to make sure that I have returned all my phone calls, answered my emails, and then I can uh, blow it. Um, but then another part of this is the Mediterranean diet, which has appeared consistently in the literature for the last four or five years as something that itself reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease. It also reduces the risk of some stroke changes in the deep white matter of the brain. So definitely worth paying attention to. This is a quick reminder of some things and where they fall on the glycemic index. Ice cream obviously would be a high item, however carrots, and carrot cake, by extension, high glycemic index. Moderate orange juice, blueberries, potatoes, even sweet potatoes. I mean, a lot of people are you know, feeling like they're holier than thou because they're having sweet potatoes and not white baked potatoes. Well, listen up, sweet potatoes are still up there. That's how they got to be carbohydrates. But anyway, the low glycemic index items you will recognize as part of the typical Mediterranean diet. Um, this is a reminder, the brain really only con constitutes 2% of your body mass. However, it's consuming 20% of the glucose because that's the only thing it can really burn. Other parts of your body can make use of glycogen or something else, but the brain really needs the glucose. So it's not like if you take all the glucose out of your diet, which would be really unfun. You, you can't get away with that. You need to have some glucose coming in. and. The problem with skyrocketing levels of glucose is not that you crash, it is the long-term effects of this behavior. So when your glucose level is high, the pancreas does its job and releases more insulin so that you can process it. However, if you have constantly high or chronically high levels of insulin in your blood, a condition called hyperinsulinemia, it actually increases your risk of obesity, larger body mass index, high blood pressure, and diabetes. Hyperinsulinemia itself does not mean diabetes, okay? So when you see this in the literature, don't think you're exempt just because you don't have diabetes. If you have high levels of insulin, it actually cuts across all ethnic groups as a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. An example of a risk factor that doesn't cut across all ethnic groups is the combination of hypertension and diabetes contributing to a risk of stroke. Really awful in Hispanic, and African-American populations. Not so bad in Asian and Caucasian populations. But this one about the high insulin, not high sugar, but high insulin is something that everybody has to worry about. It doubles your risk of Alzheimer's disease. There are some mechanisms by which this might be happening. There's probably even more that we're not even aware of because it's a complex biochemistry in the cell. But some of the things that are specific to Alzheimer's disease have to do with Insulin's floating around, it's looking for a dock. It finds the dock, it activates the insulin receptor. That actually, downstream, promotes the machinery that accumulates the amyloid and the tau protein, which are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. The other thing is that the same enzyme that's supposed to chew up your insulin would ordinarily also be available to chew up unwanted amyloid. But if you got it busy working on insulin only, it's allowing that amyloid to build up. 
okay? So just don't do it. Um, interestingly, this I just read this um, a week ago. If you are diagnosed with an insulin abnormality, insulin resistance, or hyperinsulinemia, you have a really high risk of developing signs of Alzheimer's disease, outright signs of Alzheimer's disease within three years of getting that diagnosis. So this is serious, okay? Now the authors are very responsible and they say it's not that this is causing Alzheimer's disease necessarily. The person probably has a bunch of other vulnerabilities to Alzheimer's disease going on in the background and this thing pushes you over the edge earlier to manifest your disease earlier, okay? Now the good news is if you can get past the first three years after your diagnosis of hyperinsulinemia without converting into Alzheimer's disease, you probably won't. Okay, so that's the half good news, half bad news part of it. The Mediterranean diet, I'm just putting it up there for you again in case you're not familiar with it. Um, <coughs> good dietary habits start early. So although children like the finger foods um, and it's easier for us to toss those processed things towards them, just there's got to be some effort to put this in there so that they're used to it, they expect it, they ask for it. Um, and, and I think if any of you who have worked with a personal trainer before or a nutritionist, in general, things that are highly processed, white sugar, white bread, are not as good for your system as multigrain versions of the same thing or whole grain versions because of that glycemic index. So if it's white, it pumps up, it gives you, it introduces a high level of glucose right away by insulin uh, results. When you give it in the form of the whole grains, it actually breaks down faster and you have more of the continuous release action, if you will. Um, the diet, uh, you might also notice, is something that's designed to, or, or it happens to not introduce as much cholesterol into your day. Um, and cholesterol has an interesting relationship with dementia. Of course, it would contribute to your stroke risk factors and therefore vascular dementia risk factor, but there is a connection with Alzheimer's disease. So chimpanzees are really nasty and will eat anything, um, meat, immobile, <laughs> whatever. Um, and, and we share with them some of their temper and we share with them uh, these apolipoprotein genes. And you might've heard of apolipoprotein E. One version of apolipoprotein E is highly associated with developing Alzheimer's disease. So there's some theories from comparative neurobiologists that our ability to process and make use of lots of different types of food also set us up as a risk for Alzheimer's disease. It's an interesting theory. Um, dietary control and statins were thought to have really just a cardiovascular benefit. However, there may be something to those uh, interventions decreasing the formation of the amyloid protein that you don't want because it leads to Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's also a little bit of evidence that if you have a, an abnormally low HDL level, you actually want high HDL. If you have high HDL but low LDL, you're great. And even if your cholesterol, your total cholesterol level is high, it's really the breakdown of how much HDL you have versus LDL that I'm looking at when I'm trying to assess how much risk you have for Alzheimer's disease. So keep those HDL levels high because if they're low, that actually correlates very well with that hippocampus, that memory laying down area being smaller. Now I just ran into this information last week um, and I find it very interesting. They follow different birth cohorts. So as you can imagine, someone who was born in 1908 had a very different age 80 than I do. Okay, if you think about who was born in 1908, my grandmother was actually born in 1906. So she lived through two world wars uh, and the Great Depression. So they didn't have fitness clubs and they didn't have the sugar is bad for you. They didn't have a lot of warnings about what should or shouldn't be done, but they also didn't have as much. There was, there's, there's a lot of food that comes in our plates. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to get yourself into trouble that they just didn't have then because everybody was on ration. Um, so it's a different kind of aging process. And, and what I like about this graph is that you can see from a serum cholesterol level point of view that those who were born in 1930 started off lower and continue to be lower as of their age 60. Okay, so these people, by the time 1930 came along, they already knew enough 
to get those cholesterol levels more normalized. Now, interestingly, they looked at the relative causes of dementia for these different birth cohorts. So the cases within these first three cohorts that developed dementia were the ones who had higher cholesterol levels than the rest of the cohort at age 60. And then in later cohorts, interestingly, the, the main thing was not the cholesterol anymore, it was body mass index, which is not necessarily the best indicator for obesity. There, you know, if you're a tall person, the BMI doesn't really work for you because you're supposed to weigh only 120 pounds. <laughs> so you'd be this long, tall stick. It's just the way the math of the BMI calculation works. There are, uh, the latest thing that I wrote, and I'm sure there's gonna be lots of different things that go in and out of vogue over the next 10 years, but the latest thing that I read we should go with is the hip to waist or waist to hip ratio. So the closer that ratio is to one, the more likely it is that you have some sort of truncal obesity going on. And let me tell you the scariest thing about truncal obesity. You got your rubber tire, it's bigger than, than a muffin top. It makes hormones all by itself and pumps them into your body. It's like the alien from outer space remotely controlling your function. Not good, not good. So when you look at yourself in the mirror, see what you got there because it gets to a certain critical mass, it's, it's doing its own thing. And it's not a pleasant thought, but it actually motivates me to take it easy and reduce my portion size. Um, so another thing that came from the same study that I just showed you the different cohorts is that if you have high midlife cholesterol, chances are it's going to kill you due to other things before you can get dementia. I mean, if your main goal in life is to avoid dementia, then maybe this is the way to go. Unfortunately, those people who were requiring statins to control their cholesterol in late life were also more likely to get dementia. So there's never really a good time to have abnormal cholesterol levels. And interestingly, I know that there are some people who are genetically programmed. Again, it's this gene-gene interaction thing that even if they adjust their diet and they have no fat, no butter, no fun, their cholesterol level is still high just because they're programmed to pump that cholesterol into the bloodstream whenever they can find it. Those people really need pharmacotherapy to keep the cholesterol level low. And then they can maybe return to regular diet because it won't make as much of a difference. But uh, important points about how people need to manage this. So cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease were not always appreciated as having a combined effect. In the old days when we were trying to get funding for Alzheimer's disease as its own entity, the argument against that, which went on bitterly for a few years, was that, ah, this is just what old people do. When you get older, your plumbing is falling apart, it's hardening of the arteries, and you get Alzheimer's disease. End of story, why do we have to throw millions of dollars at this? However, uh, people like Bob Katz in San Diego were able to argue coherently with pathology data that no, there's a bunch of old people with hardening of the arteries, if you will, who don't have plaques and tangles, this is the amyloid and tau, uh, and they had worse cognition than people who had hardening of the arteries that was related to how old they were. Um, so there was a long struggle just to get the funding to separate those two things. However, now that we know more, they're showing a much greater overlap. I told you before, the brain is not too big, but it wants a lot of glucose. The brain's not too big, but it wants a lot of cardiac output. And what's contributing to your cardiac output? It's the fact that you're not smoking, that you don't have diabetes, and that your cholesterol levels are normal. So again, when you go home tonight, you're sitting there looking at the refrigerator, and when are you gonna put down the hatch? What's sustainable? Take a nap every afternoon comes from the kindergarten book. Um, this is actually more important than we give it credit for as our lives go on. We don't grudge our children their naps, like it gives us a break. However, we should probably be lying down too. I don't know how many of you fall asleep at 3.30 if you're in a lecture. I am very dependable. I will go down at 3.35 and I will be up at 3.50 and I will ask a question at 3.55 to try to show that I was not asleep. But there is this S phase of the day, and all humans, the person next to you, if they're awake all the time, they're probably a robot. Um, <laughs> humans need downtime. There is this really interesting consolidation process that happens while we're asleep, if our sleep is good. So you take a bunch of information in, lots of stuff happens to you during the day. And 
And my analogy for this, which I think works, is that it's like all those things you jot down in another yellow stickity note and you put them all around your computer screen and you got a whole bunch of yellow stickies at the end of the day. Okay? At the end of seven days, it's all yellow sticky. You can't see any of the information because it's just a mosaic of yellow stickies. Well, it's that consolidation time where your brain can cross-reference and file all of these events, put them into perspective, make sure that you remember that, oh, okay, when I'm doing the lifespan thing again, maybe I need to consult the institute because now I have these faces to put with the work, etc. Without the consolidation time, you cannot learn new material very well because it's all yellow sticky. Yeah. Okay, you need to be able to stack it. Some of us are horizontal stackers, some of us are vertical stackers. Whatever way it takes, that's happening a lot during consolidation time. Now, those of you who have heard of resting network activity during functional MRI, that is the um, regional activity equivalent of consolidation. Consolidation is the process that's probably going on in those areas that light up in the resting network. Patients who have sleep apnea, we have a lot of older people who have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea itself can cause cognitive impairment. Sleep apnea, apnea itself can cause cerebrovascular disease. So sleep apnea is really important, gets ignored, gets diagnosed, but doesn't necessarily get treated because a lot of people hate the CPAP machine that is prescribed. I think we have about 20% compliance with CPAP machines. Now, if these people are not bothered by the fact that they can't remember absolutely everything that they did when they were age 45, this is their choice. But for those who really are afraid of the fact that they are not doing well as they're getting into their twilight years, as it were, um, they need to find some way to achieve better oxygenation during the night. Sleep apnea is those people, not necessarily who snore, but the people who have such a relaxed um, throat or um, nose mucosal tissue that it shuts off during the night and they are not getting oxygen, they're not breathing for a minute or two. And then there's this as they wake up. All of that change in the breathing and the amount of pressure trying to get the airway open actually creates a negative pressure system <coughs> in the chest and uh, it really messes up your circulation. So needless to say, sleep apnea, not good for you, uh, needs to be treated, needs to be treated hopefully with something, some alternative to CPAP for those who don't want to use it. Sleep, of course, is also very important with mood states. Um, people who have depression need to sleep more. Sometimes they sleep less. Um, they may need help modulating how much consolidation time they get at the end of every day. This is a whole list of, um, it's, it's one of the major portions of the kindergarten book. Um, ability of behaviors are important to start early and to continue through your life so that you can keep your social interactions healthy and vibrant. Social contact is really important at all ages, it's hard to get out of your social butterfly profile late in life. Um, so hopefully I can get people interacting in a meaningful way with their community. Everybody has a different sense of, or definition of what your community is. Your community may be your immediate family. Your community may be your neighbors. It could be your city. It could be a global network that you have of colleagues and other uh, friends who are interested in the same thing. The important thing is to stay connected as you make that transition from midlife to late life. People who retire and become depressed often complain that they feel isolated because their whole social interaction turned out to be related to work. Or their spouse was the one who was the social director. They lose the spouse after they retire and whammo. They don't know how to make those phone calls to say, how about going to that movie with me or come over for coffee. Um, this is really important. Those in late life who report feeling isolated, some people like their alone time, but those who feel isolated have almost a double Alzheimer's disease risk. Um, this is an important port source of cognitive stimulation. Um, you will see in papers that come out about what types of activities in midlife kept you going longer in late life. People are very high on um, things that are very challenging, that bring novelty to your life, and I have to say the, the cheapest way to get novel stimulation is to try to talk to somebody because they'll never do what you want them to do. Um, and they'll come back with surprising things and to negotiate relationships takes work. It is cognitive, cognitively stimulate, stimulating. Um, so there are some ways in which the kindergarten book doesn't apply to you in late life. Um, 
in kindergarten, it's like, don't be afraid to fall. Um, you'll bounce back. But that doesn't happen when we're older. Um, and uh, one of the things that I try to promote when I'm prescribing exercise for someone is stretching and working on your elasticity because that will actually help you to reduce falls or reduce the consequences of falling. An elderly person who falls, especially if they break a hip, is on a slippery slope because of the immobility, the isolation that can result, the poor nutrition, if you don't have somebody coming to you with the food that you like to eat that's good for you, all kinds of nasty things cascade from a fall when you're older. Um, and I'm gonna just fast forward to, we've been talking about people who still have a lot of control over their lives, a lot of autonomy, um, who may be taking care of other people, but I do need to consider what's going on for someone with a dementia, because dementia goes on a long time. It's not like a fast-moving cancer that's gonna kill you in two years. There are patients who go on for 15 years after they've started to have memory loss. So what should they be doing? Well, they should be doing everything that they can still do. When you're in an early stage of dementia, just because you can't keep score doesn't mean you can't play tennis. And we have to remind families sometimes that as protective as they may be feeling about their loved one, it's okay for them to make mistakes. And if you explain to friends and teammates that you know his responsibilities may not be work out if they're the same, he can't organize a team dinner anymore, but he would still love to play, people can be extremely accommodating and, and really movingly helpful. Um, so we need to keep them involved in whatever way is meaningful to them. And caregiver distress can arise when they lose sight of what they actually do need to accomplish for the patient on a daily basis. I think when you first become a caregiver, you get the diagnosis, you think, I need to get on the internet and find a cure. I need to get this person to every doctor who can help. I need to be a saint and be patient with every mistake. I need to clean up after this guy and I need to make him feel like, I need to fool him into thinking he's doing everything right. Um, and I need to do this with all the pleasantness and tolerance that I can muster up 24 seven. Well, that's impossible. You're gonna lose it from time to time because it's frustrating, it's hard, and that's okay. But it'll help if you can bring the objectives for the day down to what really needs to happen. And these things are really, really important to the patient. I don't wanna feel pain during my day. Doesn't matter whether you're a patient or one of us in this room. You wanna have a pain-free day. You wanna feel safe. Now, for a patient with dementia who has delusions, it may be difficult to feel safe without using some kind of medication to dim down the psychosis. Um, so safe may mean medication. Safe may mean Protect me from people who are gonna ask me to do stuff that I can't do. Protect me from people who are gonna quiz me. Um, sometimes the caregiver is the quizzer. The caregiver says, okay, we're going to the doctor's office. Remember, it's January 13th. The doctor's name is Dr. Chow. Uh, 100 minus seven is 93. Repeat after me, 93 minus seven is 86. It's, it's painful to see that happen for patients who really can't do it anymore because they understand tone very well. And if your tone is rising into that, I'm irritated with you, they may not understand why, or even if they understand why, they're not gonna like it. And it becomes a difficult interaction. So meaningful activities for the patient at various stages of illness, but especially in a late stage, may not be a conversation about a lucid memory or anything that you care about. It may mean sitting quietly with the dog in the sun and recognizing a bird has flown by. But it's important to have some kind of something that happened that was meaningful in a good way. Maximal autonomy. Now, as the patient becomes less able to do things for themselves, they're making fewer decisions, but wherever possible, we try to give them options. Um, and, and unfortunately, one of the frustrating things about patients who can't communicate effectively anymore is that we're making all the decisions for them. It's hard on the caregiver and it's hard on the caregiver who knows the patient so well that they know that this is such a drastic change from before. Now, the caregiver is allowed to have quality of life too. I think that quality of life is enhanced when I can get them to just focus on these things. They're, they're, they're simply elegant. A lot of people who have been living with the patient for decades can do this. 
And then everything else is whipped cream and cherry on top. And when we put it in that perspective, there's this visible sigh of relief. And for the caregiver, they want to have some sort of meaningful interaction with the patient. They want to feel like they were able to do something for that patient that day. So if they did these things, big check mark, the to-do list is completed for today on that aspect. Sometimes it has to be feeding. I was able to feed them lunch today. That's cool. Um, they want to feel some sort of emotional connection. It's huge when the patient recognizes them, smiles at their entry into the room, squeezes their hand a little bit harder. And then what else is huge is to remind the caregiver that quality downtime counts. So if we're just sitting in the same room together, I'm watching TV, you may not be watching TV, but we have a quiet time together where we both feel safe and you're not nagging me, I'm not irritating you, we're in a good place. And the people who I consider to be the master caregivers among my clients at, at Baycrest are the ones who have been able to negotiate or adapt to the sense that we're going to just have some good downtime together and that's our good day. The part that I think is um, important for the healthcare team to take care of on the behalf of the caregiver is to reassure that caregiver that everything that can be done is being done. That I went to that conference and I was listening for something that would be relevant to you and while we do have some stuff on the far horizon, unfortunately I don't have anything on the shelf for you now, but you have done your due diligence by checking in with me today. We have reviewed the medications. We are not over medicating this patient. We have plugged you into all of the community resources that you are eligible for. I've told you about other things that the patient may be able to do. I've uh, prescribed an exercise program if that's a thing that needs to happen for a patient who's hyperactive and is getting into everything all the time. Um, that's our job because they don't know that everything that can be done is being done. Their fear is that the patient will die and they'll find out the next day there was one thing they could have done that would have made a huge difference and that we have to spare them now. So I'm coming to the end of the, the formal talk part and I, these are for you. Um, they were uh, written, I believe, at the place where I saw them was from um, Sackett at McMaster in the context of when you're mentoring somebody else in an academic setting. However, I think these are really good for life. Um, think about what are the things that you do during your day that you want to stop doing? Like, did you say yes to doing some kind of committee duty uh, that you don't really have to do because you already have enough brownie points for this year? You know, a lot of us get into this thing where we don't think we can say no, but as time goes on in your life, you learn how to say no um, and you can maximize the quality time. So there's stuff you should say yes to, there's stuff that you wish you had said yes to earlier. You need to reschedule your day so that you can fit in the things that you need to keep doing. And they're not going to start unless you start them. You don't have anybody else who's going to beat you over the head until you start eating better. It's all self-driven. Um, so my main take home point for you is figure out what do you need to feel safe, joyful, healthy, connected. These will actually guide what you're doing with your diet, what you're doing with your stress, what you're doing with your exercise. And in turn, that'll set you up better for your future. And what are you doing that you can sustain over time? We all have certain things that we know we have to do for a limited time only, just to get past a certain crunch. I understand that. But the more that you can put on your schedule that is something that you enjoy, that's good for you, that you can sustain, the better off you'll be. So at this point, I, there's all sorts of stuff we can discuss. I know there are people online who are going to try to tag in through Lucy, I guess. So, um, how much time do we have for this point? Um, 30 minutes. Okay, so we have 30 minutes. And at the end of the 30 minutes, I'm going to run back to my car because the parking meter will run out. Sure, there's several types of dementia, um, and um, you know what, maybe I'll type it up on the thing as I speak, so. Is that projecting okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're an older person, far and away, the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, okay? And that's got um, the amyloid and tau clumping together to form 
plaques and tangles, respectively. Um, the hallmark feature is memory loss, but word loss is also an early feature. So, oh, I oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. That thing that you use to tell time. I've got one. I think you've got one too. Uh, that kind of thing it happens, especially for a good two or four years before other things start to change. Other things being the other cognitive domains. So your ability to remember where things are in space or find your car in the parking lot is a practical example. Um, previous skills that you were really good, perhaps you developed them for your career, but you're starting to fall apart on those. Um, I had said um, your calculations, um, your social skills or your personality is another cognitive domain. Um, now the arguable second most common cause of dementia is vascular dementia and it's arguable for two reasons. One is a lot of Alzheimer's disease patients also have cerebrovascular disease going on. So there's overlap between these two entities. The other reason that's controversial is because there's another entity called dementia with Lewy bodies. Yeah, everybody can see how I'm typing. Why is that? Oh, you have the funky keyboard. Okay. It's a keyboard, not me. Um, <laughs> dementia with Lewy bodies is uh, an interesting combination of Alzheimer's disease symptoms and Parkinson's disease symptoms. So those of you who are neurology junkies will recognize the Lewy bodies in this title from the Lewy bodies that are the pathological component in Parkinson's disease. So these patients have amyloid that's abnormal and they have Lewy bodies which are basically clumps of alpha synuclein. A whole branch of neuroscience called synucleinopathies and so those researchers are trying to find ways to keep alpha synuclein from building up and causing Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, or some other kinds of Parkinson's plus symptoms like multi-system atrophy. Hello. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so those are three very common causes of dementia. Another one, which is the one that I've been specializing in, is called frontotemporal dementia. And this is really interesting for me because I'm sort of a closet psychiatrist along with neurology. The frontal lobes and temporal lobes, when both affected at the front part of the brain, are the ones that handle your comportment, your social skills, and your personality. So patients with frontotemporal dementia oftentimes will do a 180 degree uh, change from mild-mannered citizen to completely disinhibited, um, sweets craving, uh, insistent, mentally rigid, obsessive compulsive. Um, and these patients are significantly younger at the time of onset than patients with the other three types of dementia. Patients with frontotemporal dementia start in their 50s. And this is particularly horrifying uh, for many of us because if you think about it, they still have kids living at home, they're still working. So there's a lot of liability for large errors made on the job. A lot of these people have ascended to very high responsibility in their corporation, and they're making very expensive mistakes. They may be making terrible interpersonal mistakes. Some of these people get arrested for sexually deviant behaviors. Um, it's, it's a very, very serious um, uh, dementia in terms of its impact on the people around them. Uh, Alzheimer's disease patients tend to become more mousy and shut in and quiet, but these patients really get out there. Um, so I, I find it fascinating. Um, it's, it's a really good interface between psychiatry and neurology. Um, and uh, for those people who have, like the more philosophical bent of neuroscience, are you still yourself if you're not exhibiting the same aspects of your personality? Are you still yourself if you don't think the same way you did before? still in the same shell, but it's a qualitatively different experience to be with you. And this is so hard for the family members. The spouses are stuck because they don't have a relationship with that person anymore. In Alzheimer's disease, they maintain social skills well into illness. And even though they may not be able to name the loved one who's sitting right next to them, they actually know that that is my, this is my significant other. And I'm, I can lean against him whenever I want to, and that feels good. But with frontotemporal dementia, you have extramarital affairs, um, uh, very sketchy uh, mixed feelings, and inability to process those mixed emotions. Um, 
it, it's really it's really difficult, and um, and these patients and their families require a lot more counseling. So, do you know the causes of the frontal? So, frontotemporal dementia. Yes. Um, so, there are several proteins that have implicated been implicated in brain studies of patients with frontotemporal dementia. So, one of the abnormal proteins is also tau, but in a different abnormal formulation than you find in Alzheimer's disease. So, when somebody says tauopathy, which strictly defined as a problem with tau, they could be talking about Alzheimer's disease, and they could also be talking about frontotemporal dementia. Can you diagnose that before death? Or it's only? very hard to diagnose before death. We have been scrambling to try to find a radioactive label that we could use to tag tau in the same way that amyloid seems to be tagged by a compound called mm. PIV. What you do is you make a, you figure out what sticks to the protein of interest, you make it radioactive, you inject it into the patient, you put them into a PET scanner, we have one a block and a half away here in Toronto, um, and you count how much radioactivity is stuck in the brain after a certain amount of circulation time has passed. Um, and interestingly, there's a large debate about how much information the amyloid PET scan really gives you. Because there are some patients who are completely normal, no complaints of memory loss, no errors on memory testing, who have a lot of amyloid in their brain. Is that somebody who's going to get Alzheimer's disease and is currently compensating well? Not so sure. There are also patients with flagrant Alzheimer's disease who have very low amyloid levels. Is that because they have a whole bunch of tau sitting in there that's causing the problem more so than the amyloid? We don't know yet because it's hard to label the tau. Why is it hard to label the tau? It's a protein, it should be labelable. However, the abnormal amyloid is forming outside of the cell, outside of the neuron. The abnormal tau is getting gummed up inside the neuron. So you need to get the radioactive tracer in past the blood-brain barrier and then in across the membrane, stick to the tau, stay on the tau, don't stick to other things. It's, it's, it's a really complicated technical feat, and that's why they haven't done it yet, but of course it would be great if you could do that. So tau is one of three proteins that have been identified as causing frontotemporal dementia. In Alzheimer's disease, the tau and the amyloid are there together. In frontotemporal dementia, you've got one of these three at a time, not all three or not a combination of two out of three, just one. So they might have tau, or they may have TDP43, TAR DNA binding protein. TAR is an acronym itself, which stands for transactives. <laughs> I can't remember what the last part of it is. TAR um, DNA uh, binding protein number 43 is unfortunately not completely specific to frontotemporal dementia. There are a certain number of patients with Alzheimer's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies that have it at autopsy. So even if we had a label, a radio tracer that stuck to TDP43, it might not be specific for diagnostic purposes. It might be helpful in that when science moves along to the point where we have interventions that we can administer that attack a particular proteinopathy process, we might want to know. I want the TDP43 item off the shelf. I don't want the tau. Or I want the tau and I don't want the TDP43. So this is useful information to have once we can generate it. The third of prote uh, the three proteins that can cause frontotemporal dementia is called FUS protein, F-U-S. That stands for fused in sarcoma protein. Doesn't really sound like something that would have to do with the brain, let alone dementia. However, it was first um, noticed in a type of cancer called the sarcoma. So it got that name, the name stuck, we're stuck with the name. Um, I'm trying to think um, what are other types of dementia that you need to know about. Um, these are the top three of the ones that are common among the elderly population. Frontotemporal dementia and early onset Alzheimer's disease are more commonly occurring in people who start manifesting in their 50s. For people under 50 um, who have dementia, at least until recently, HIV dementia was the most common cause. Now we have much better drugs for HIV these days. The diagnosis can be made earlier. All the right stuff has happened in terms of research <coughs> or clinical care of HIV and HIV associated illnesses. So I'm, I don't see in the literature that this has been supplanted by something else, um, but I'm, I know that the incidence of this has gone way down in the last 10 years and that's, that's a really good thing. And I, I have to say that the people in dementia research have 
taken um, a lot of clues from how HIV researchers were able to raise funds and get all of that going. When I was in medical school, uh, we had nothing as an antiviral for HIV. And now, when you get the brochure that's distributed by um, the Ministry of Health, is this fold-out brochure that has to be color-coded because there's so many different classes of medications that are used in concert together against the illness. So that is really cool. It took a long time to develop that, but I think we can do it too in dementia, so I'm, I'm optimist, optimistic. Yes, Lucy. Hi, so we have three questions, one from me personally, and there are two people online. So are you gonna put yours first, or? Um, I can <laughs> ask their questions first. Okay, yeah. all right, I, I promise I'll make time for yours. Okay, it's okay. a really fast question. Okay, so um, Shelly asks, can Dr. Chow comment on the rate of incident dementia she may be seeing among caregivers, particularly spousal caregivers, caring for a spouse with dementia, and then themselves develop a dementia? So, this, Shelly, this is an important question, and it's come up in the news recently because a lot of people are interested in the answer to this question, and there have been a couple of researchers looking at it. Um, the one that I can remember most clearly is um, about gender differences in the caregivers who might be affected. And unfortunately, for us women, uh, women caregivers tend to have cognitive impairment uh, related to their caregiving. And the men caregivers don't necessarily have more um, cognitive impairment than men who are not caregivers. Um, there is a difference in, in, and I'm speaking in general, certainly there's, there's fantastic caregivers of both genders, but in general, the, the women knock themselves out and are very territorial about the patient. And I'm the one who needs to take care of him, and I don't need any help. There's a lot of, in my clinical experience, refusal of getting people interconnected, which wears them out. And just like we were talking about mommy brain before, I think there is such a thing as caregiver brain. Um, that can, of course, work in concert with whatever other genetic or environmental or lifetime vulnerabilities that this person has developed over time and contribute to an earlier manifestation of the dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, if it was going to happen later. Um, the other thing about caregiving I think that's important is a lot of people will put off their own health needs because they think, I'm just gonna do this for another couple of years and then he's either going to a nursing home or he'll die from his illness and then I can get back to taking care of myself. However, one of the things that I did write down as a take home point is that it is in your late life that you really need to be taking care of all this stuff. Hopefully you've been doing it all along and you're just continuing a good habit, but it's especially important to watch your nutrition, make sure that whatever other illnesses you might have are being treated because pain, difficulty with your heartbeat, difficulty with your respiratory function are going to not enable your brain to function at top level. You're already tired from the caregiving and ignoring your own needs really doesn't get you any further. So sort of a long answer, but. Thank you. So the second one's from Hannah, and um, she said, thanks for this presentation. Can you speak about the effects of some common drugs, for example, caffeine, alcohol, and cannabis, on the risk for developing of dementia? Okay, this is a multi-part question, so I have to write down uh, caffeine, alcohol, oops, oh, yeah. Alcohol, cannabis, I'm gonna throw in ecstasy too, just because I have a comment about that. Okay, good question. Um, and a lot of this has more to do with, again, your mid to earlier life, as opposed to late midlife to late life. Um, so I haven't seen anything in the literature that um, condemns caffeine use. However, if you use common sense, and you understand what caffeine does to your body, there are some people who are genetically, environmentally, more susceptible to the effects of caffeine. Um, and you can use that to your advantage. If you really need to stay up all night to write that grant, caffeine is your thing. Um, however, you just don't ever want to keep yourself sleep deprived. Um, you don't want anything that's going to increase your blood pressure. Those are the things that will increase your dementia risk. So use your caffeine accordingly. The other thing that happens with caffeine is um, it incites your stomach acid production. That in and of itself doesn't give you dementia. However, if you have a propensity towards stomach ulcers or peptic ulcers, it actually keeps you from being able to take the currently available medications for Alzheimer's disease 
without having side effects. So if you're planning way ahead <laughs> to be able to take the drugs that you might be able to need, um, you might want to watch your caffeine intake. And again, everybody's different in terms of how much they tolerate, um, so I, I leave it up to your own judgment. Alcohol, really interesting. So uh, when I was a medical student, they used to say that one of the frequent causes of dementia is alcohol, to give you something called an alcoholic dementia. And they described it very clearly, so it sounded like it was a real thing. It attacks the frontal lobes, patients are disinhibited, they're not able to remember things. Due to the alcohol intake that's required to get alcoholic dementia, they often have poor nutrition, so they might have a, a thiamine deficiency, and they get the Wernicke's encephalopathy. So they've got optic ataxia, um, and, uh, and they also uh, can't remember things. And the memory loss is interesting because it happens in lacoons. So I can remember everything except, oh, I know I'm married, I don't remember anything about my wedding day or how I met my spouse. Things like that, they're very kind of, very odd, very idiosyncratic, so it would be easy to make this diagnosis. However, in my career, I have not been able to diagnose anybody distinctively with just alcoholic dementia. There are patients with Alzheimer's disease, that's gonna be the most common thing if you have to bet money, who drink too much and are more confused when they drink alcohol. But it's really actually rare to find patients with alcoholic dementia, and it's the only thing that's causing their dementia. Every once in a while, you might have somebody who has the Wernicke's encephalopathy, but if you can stop their drinking, it does not progress. And the whole definition behind a dementia syndrome is that it is acquired and it is progressive. We have, often have to ask families, once we've made a diagnosis, how much access the patient has to alcohol and whether they are making use of that access. Uh, patients, although they may not be able to remember anything, can still be pretty crafty about their use or abuse of substances. So we have patients who drink the alcohol and fill the bottles back up with water. And the family doesn't realize until months later that, hmm, somebody must have drunk this and there are no children who would be doing this in the house and it must have been the person with dementia. Interestingly, when we can catch that in time and we can actually get better supervision of the access to alcohol, patients can actually sharpen up a little bit. Um, so, an interesting discussion about alcohol. Um, there is more to say about it, but I will let you look it up in PubMed. That's the main thing. Um, oh, no, one more thing. Interestingly, when alcoholics die and they go to autopsy, they roll their body to science, um, their blood vessels, their arteries in the brain are clean, like whistle clean, like they must be five years old. It's really interesting. So you get cleaner arteries, you don't get the cholesterol plaques, but instead you're more vulnerable to falling. And if your liver's not working well due to alcohol abuse, you have a longer bleeding time. So your cause of death might actually be a hemorrhage in the brain, as opposed to constriction of the arteries and not getting enough blood delivered to your squash. Um, cannabis is really interesting because there are effects of the THC on an area of the brain called the basal ganglia. And these may actually be helpful to people with Parkinson's disease and by extension, Parkinson's disease with dementia. So if you want to look up more on this, you would look up cannabinoids. So let me spell that here. Um, Susan Fox at the University of Toronto, who works at Toronto Western Hospital, has published some on this area. It's a really interesting field. There's a possibility that these um, components would be helpful for patients with multiple sclerosis as well. Um, we don't really have time to get into the nitty gritty of what the basal ganglia do for you, but they do a lot of important things as mediators along cognitive pathways, as well as behavior. I don't think there's as much written about the behavioral effects, but um, it's an emerging field and, uh, and certainly very interesting. If you're a cannabis user, um, it, it's very interesting because there's a quiz that almost always appears, or a quiz question that almost always appears on standardized tests for psychiatry residents, which is the main risk of cannabis abuse is, uh, and there's four things that all sound pretty scary, um, but generally um, it cuts down on your productivity, makes you a little bit sleepy, but it doesn't apparently ruin your brain, um, as opposed to ecstasy. Ecstasy is the scary one because it is very pro-serotonergic. And ecstasy users, even those who've only used it a couple of times, or maybe it's the reporting bias, um, they may say they were only using it twice, but they've used it for a whole year at various rates. In any case, you lose serotonin receptors when you use ecstasy. Um, I never thought I'd be one of those, this is your brain on drugs, 
kinds of announcers. But I, I was pretty stunned. I was doing some PET imaging studies looking at serotonin receptors. And a lot of the work that was done at CAMH by Steve Kish has to do with what's happening to your brain on ecstasy. Um, interestingly, the effects of ecstasy, the affiliative behaviors, are desirable. I'm talking about how you need to keep yourself from being isolated, you need to be a social, social being. Um, the ecstasy helps people to do that. Well, so does oxytocin. So there are quite a few researchers who are looking at the effects of oxytocin, nasal spray delivery, in terms of enhancing trust. And um, specifically, there's a study uh, that said that people who have a little schnuff of, of oxytocin before their psychotherapy session end up getting more out of the cognitive behavioral therapy. How about that? That's kind of cool. I, it's one of those things where, um, you know, if you could get your hands on something, it's not that easy. It, this would be an interesting party trick. Um, probably safer for you than using ecstasy. So. Um, Anyway, that's, that's a comment on ecstasy. I hope I answered the question, Hannah. Yeah. Lucy? So my question is, um, uh, so as a doctor, right, how do you generally like recommend people to like take note of the difference between the early onset of dementia and um, Alzheimer's disease, for example, versus just the normal signs of aging? Okay, so what are the things that are going to make us alarm? Uh, let me just put in one of these guys. I can help. So, um, normal aging versus early signs of dementia. And so the dementia thing will be on the side. This keyboard. Okay. So for dementia, um, loss of overlearned skills. Like if I had a hobby of um, building birdhouses, and I can't figure out where my hammer and nails are in the basement, this is a problem. Um, people with normal aging may show that they are doing the old task slower, but they'll still be able to do it. It's a big difference, okay? Dementia, can't remember important things. And on the other side here, harder to remember new info, especially a peripheral. So um, as we get older, we have a lot more names in our mental address book, and we may be slower to learn people's names, unless we say them three times, Susan, that's twice. <laughs> um, even, that, even at that, if I say Susan's name three times before I leave here today and I don't see you again for three years, I'm not gonna be able to access it, I'm sorry. Don't take it personally, but it's because I'm getting older. Um, uh, if an older person really can't remember something that they uh, use frequently, visit frequently, um, that's significant. People who are normally aging are having difficulty with new information. Um, uh, in normal aging, uh, misplacing items can occur um, in, uh, in this instance, the same kind of thing if um, it becomes accusations of theft, or you're moving my stuff around again, you always hide things from me. Um, now, some couples have that dynamic. <laughs> but if there's this new um, suspiciousness or even paranoia, delusions, that's definitely not part of normal aging. Um, uh, Overlearned skills I'm gonna use here to include your ability to handle the finances, balancing the checkbook. Now, some people were exempted from these duties uh, by their spouses, either because they were never good at them or because the spouse is more obsessive compulsive. If they weren't doing it before and they can't do it now, I don't take off points. And, and uh, at the same time, if this is the person who was always crossing every T and dotting every I and now they're losing that perspicacity, that's, that might be cause for alarm. Um, major change in behavior. We all have some degree of routine in our lives. Um, if the routine is now really, really intense, something's going on, if only just stress or a mood or adjustment disorder or something like that. Um, but that can be a red flag. Um, in normal aging, I would have to say in terms of mood and stuff, um, 
there are losses. Loss of your job when you retire or loss of your job because you got laid off, loss of a spouse, loss of close friends who have poor health as they age. Um, so you're gonna have to cut some slack for grieving processes. Um, however, usually those grieving processes last up to six months, up to which point we don't worry about it, but if it keeps on persisting and the patient is still feeling very low motivation, lack of pleasure in the usual hobbies and activities, then we actually start to evaluate whether this person is having a major depressive episode and needs treatment with an antidepressant. Um, so I think those are the main things that pop into mind in terms of what's the difference. Certainly people who are going through normal aging who have a parent who's had definitely Alzheimer's disease or some other dementia come in early usually when, when they forget one thing and they, they start booking appointments. Um, <laughs> and that's okay because we do want to hear about it. We want to reassure them if we can. Um, oftentimes it's handy for them to have a baseline assessment. Like today in 2010, December of 2010, uh, you have strengths and weaknesses. We all do in our intellectual testing. These are what they are. Based on these weaknesses, it might be really helpful for you to actually get a Palm Pilot or some PDA that has a reminder system. Or it may be helpful for you to do fewer things at a time. Or it might be helpful for you to do more in the morning and less in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Whatever. That's the neuropsychologist's job. To find the strengths and weaknesses and help them strategize how to make the most out of those strengths and to minimize the times that the weaknesses are on display. Over time, if you get more weaknesses or those strengths turn into weaknesses, then that's an evolving pattern and needs to be addressed. Sometimes it's not always dementia. There's this whole phase that we call mild cognitive impairment that can be caught between normal aging and full-blown dementia. Full-blown dementia meaning that you cannot function independently because two or more cognitive domains are impaired. So there's a lot of mush space in between and mild cognitive impairment is not always due to early, early Alzheimer's disease be due to depression or other mood states. It can be due to sleep apnea. We are just about out. Lucy, did you get any last minute quick questions? Uh, no. Okay. okay. So I think that's it. Thanks for your attention.